I guess it's pretty obvious looking at this card uh, what it is. <laughs> um, they usually don't name this card, these old packs. And, uh, everybody, <clears throat> I'm sure, will recognize it straight away as the death card. And um, because that figure, you know, the, the skeleton with the scythe um, is just even today is just, uh, you know, immediately recognizable to most people who, uh, you know, um, have been around a bit, will recognize it as the Grim Reaper. That's what it used to be called, the Grim Reaper. It's death. It's the symbol of death, you know, riding a horse. That's one of the, the four horsemen of the apocalypse, death. And um, reaping the harvest um, of, of, of all of the living who eventually eventually come to this end. It's the, it's the nature of life. And um, <clears throat> if you, I'll just point this one out. If you look at the... Um, the Visconti card, if you can quite see there, yeah. Um, you've even got nobles and, you know, clerics, like religious. Everybody comes to it in the end. There, there it is. Death eventually cuts you down and tramples over you and sends you off to wherever you're going to go after you've died. Many, many people now believe nowhere. They just simply believe that that's the absolute end. <clears throat> um, it'll have become clear in the way that I commented on the last card, if I remember rightly, that was the Hanged Man. Um, it, um, it will become... It'll, it'll be obviously obvious to you that... There are different ways, you know, to interpret these cards. You can see them as... They're, they're all realistic in various ways, but, but there are different dimensions of reality that they, can be, they c could be pertaining to. It is true that um, we, we all are mortal beings and we all are going to die and our death is certainly going to be real. <clears throat> That's true. Nevertheless, our perceptions of reality, even our perceptions of physical reality, this is what, this is what we must remember uh, in looking at these cards. And conversely, you know, uh, 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 Following the example of the cards, we should remember it in our lives anyway. That our experience of reality is a psychological experience. And our psychology is a reality too. Uh, however, the point, the point is that the experience of reality, in this case the, ex the anticipation of death... As, as a very real thing, that in itself is a, is a psychological experience. That doesn't make it unreal. That's just to qualify the nature of, of this reality, of what it is that we are experiencing here. We are experiencing a psychological reality. And part of our psychology is the recognition that physicality is not just real, but is, is deeply, is, is deeply uh, profound. It's, it's fundamental to our being. We, we, experience, we experience ourselves as embodied minds. And the bodies which we are embodied in inhabit a physical world. So we experience ourselves as a being in a world. Um, from a Buddhist point of view, we have a, a bit of a tendency to experience ourselves as a being on its own uh, rather too much and not realize that, no, it's, it's, the, full, it's the full picture 
that 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 makes our perception real. We are not just a being, a being there to to what you know to to pursue our own interests or to to whatever. We actually are a being in a world, and it it. The way that in Gestalt therapy um, they, they kind of explain this, you can't, you cannot define a walker without the walking and the ground which the walker is walking on. You cannot define a walker as a walker unless you include the walking and the ground upon which that person is walking. When I say define, I mean you cannot even discern a person as a walker apart from their walking on the ground. We tend to forget that. It is the ground and the walking which makes the person a walker. And that principle applies to, this is what we don't usually realize, it applies to absolutely everything that we do, including constitute our own body. We are only a body because we constitute our body. And we constitute our body only in relation to the world in which we live, which provides us with our needs. So we, we are nothing apart from our assimilation of the world to ourselves. Unless we include the world and our assimilating activity, our adaptive behavior, unless we include all of those, we are not a person. We are not persons. Um, I'm not sure what we would be. I mean, I'm not sure whether there would be any consciousness. Would Well, that's part of what, what the mystery of it all is. Um, the point I'm making here is that we are alive now, and generally speaking, we don't want to die, and yet death is an inevitability. And that is a psychological experience. And that means that if it's problematic, it is a psychological problem. I mean, these cards are not simply, you know, they're not simply snapshots of life. They're not just simply, oh, you know, well, this is what life is like. No, they're far, they're far, far more than that. Um, as, a, as, a, a, as we've seen from the beginning, life is a problem. You start off with no power at all. And somehow or other, you have to move away from complete dependence upon your guardians into becoming independent and independently able to stave off death. Um, and yet it's still a psychological problem because death is inevitable. And so really all we're doing is giving ourselves a life which is bounded at one end by birth and at the other end by death. And these cards are all about acquiring, developing a comportment, a personal comportment towards reality, which conforms to the nature of reality. It's, in, in other words, it, it's, re it's, re it's really about making one's peace with the very sobering realities of life itself. It, it, we're always egocentric, by the way. I mean, I know that when we talk about these things, we tend to say, oh, you know, you've got to overcome your egocentricity. Well, I mean, it's important to really understand what that means because we're always egocentric. The ego is nothing more than the conscious self. And in order for the conscious self to, to survive, it has to fulfill its own needs. Um, and in that sense, it's always going to be egocentric. You can never, ever not be egocentric. 
It's just that there's a bit of a convention involved here. When we talk about egocentricity, we usually mean selfishness. And um, what we really mean is that by, by overcoming egocentricity is understanding that the world which we love, we're bound to love it because it, it is our ground. It's the ground of our existence. The world provides our existence. If you didn't believe in divine providence, you, you would certainly have to believe in natural providence because the fact is that you are pre-adapted to belong to this world. Um, this world gives you your oxygen, it gives you your warmth, it gives you the fluids that you need to drink, and it gives you your food. It gives you all the materials that you need to make a home for yourself and to make a life for yourself and to fulfill your sexual nature. Your sexual nature is... is um, Is, is dual, is dual. It, it, it's got dual, very, very important dual characteristics. On the one hand, your sexual nature is erotic. It is, me, meaning it is the source of intense pleasure. And as such, it's, um, it, it, the world provides you with the means of fulfilling your appetite for sexual pleasure. Um, most of us find that in the opposite sex, but not all of us. Um, but also, you know, the very, very big clue, it's also procreative. And in reality, those, even for homosexuals, even for complete sexual perverts of various kinds, the fact of, the, the fact of it is, is that sexuality nevertheless is still pro-creative. Um, it gives rise to babies. And then those babies need you, and unless you, unless you close yourself off to them, you become a parent, and your child teaches you how to be a good parent, and it reveals to you when you're being a bad parent. And so the entire the entire burdens, uh, the entire fulfillment, the, 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 full f the, the gratifications of being a pet, all of that comes from sexuality and is part and parcel of sexuality, even though there are these two distinct sides to it, you know, the procreative side and the intensely erotic side. Um, It is very easy to be swept away by the erotic side and human culture in every culture understands this. You can't see it anywhere more clearly than in Islamic culture where the, the, the destabilizing potential of sexuality is dealt with by, in some cases, almost completely covering up the sexual provocativeness to men of women. So that you see, you know, um, basically the, the veil, uh, the, the, in the extreme case, the burqa, the, the, the complete concealment of a woman's sexual appeal. I mean, you know, wives don't wear burqas at home. They wear them out in public and, you know, to stop men other than their husbands from responding involuntarily to their sexual appeal. In Western society, um, even, in, even in Christian, even in, even in the most orthodox Christian days, a woman's sex appeal sexual appeal was not concealed in that way because sexual self-discipline was expected of men 
Um, and from a Christian point of view, you cannot help but ask yourself, um, doesn't Islamic society surely really basically mollycoddle men in, 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 in the sexual arena? Surely it's, it's expecting very little of men um, if it feels that women should carry all of the burden of um, sexual self-discipline by completely concealing the, the, their outward appearance. Um, to us in the West, um, coming out of our Christian background, I mean, that just seems extraordinary that, that, that women should have to bear the entire burden of um, problematic uh, sexual appeal, which is indiscriminate and involuntary. For us, we say, yes, it is indiscriminate, it is involuntary, and you have to control yourself as a result, whether you're a man or a woman, it should be equal. Oh, and of course, nowadays, it's, it's more and more... Well, even now, I mean, of course, um, sexual self-control is still... Is, in fact, it's gone too far in the opposite direction now, in the West. Now, um, women, in, 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 in the name of women's rights, women are allowed to um, really... W w wander around in incredibly provocative uh, clothing or making provocative gestures and, 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 and men are expected to um, control themselves no matter what, um, which to me seems absolutely grossly unjust. Because even if men do um, not immediately jump on, on a woman if she's incredibly sexual provocative, how do they deal with that intense desire to do that? I mean, the only way they can do it is to crush, internally crush their own se sexual drive. I mean, how else can you live with it other than to squash your sexual drive? It, it, it just becomes impossible for men, in my opinion. And I'm, not ta I'm talking about men on the average. I mean, obviously, men differ... Um, differ intensely on on uh, the they differ in terms of their ability to control themselves and they also differ in the intensity of their sexual appetites these are variables and yet we treat everybody as though they're just the same which um, I seem to if I remember rightly Freud thought that was extremely uh, unfair of society uh, Fro Fro Freud was very much a, a classical liberal, um, extended into the, into the area of sexuality as well. Um, <clears throat> here we're looking at the death card. It is a psychological experience. We are contemplating it now because we are trying to anticipate. We are trying to. We are trying to. Buddhists do this, by the way. That in Buddhism traditionally, students are, are encouraged to meditate in charnel grounds. Charnel grounds are grounds where people's mortal remains after death are left to decay where they will be naturally consumed by various natural predators um, and, um, you know, for eagles or hyenas or whatever it is, uh, you know, dogs, um, insects, bugs, <laughs> God knows what, they all eat you up once you're dead. Um, you know, and the idea is to meditate in charnel grounds in order to absolutely impress people how impermanent life is. You never know when, and, and Christianity does the same, you never know when death is going to come and snatch away your life. You never know. As, as Christ said, you know, death comes like a thief in the night. You never know when it's going to come and take you away. And you need to live with the absolute certain knowledge of that in order to avoid clinging on to what is actually radically impermanent. 
And so I see this card not just as a, a simple um, reminder that, 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 that we, we do indeed die, um, but this is, a, this, this is just exactly the equivalent of the Buddhist meditation in the charnel ground, meditating on the, 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 final, the finality aspect of the radic... If the wheel of life, if you didn't get it, m meditating on the wheel of life, the the, 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 the the radical transience of the present moment, then this card um, this this card is is bringing it home to you that that radical impermanence is going to culminate in the complete end of your current self project. And of course, in Christianity, there's no belief in rebirth or reincarnation there's belief in resurrection but in, but in christianity and judaism it it is believed that this is your one and only life it is final death is a finality it's not just a transitional point in in a multitude you know in in, in an endless well in in, in, in not, not endless but um um a, a long procession of reincarnations you know rebirths and and so on no in the christian tradition and this is the christian tradition this is the western tradition this is the judeo-christian tradition which is trying to come to terms with these these neoplatonic um, um, pr principles and these principles from classical antiquity it is a christian society which is trying to trying to make sense of these things and absorb them into its own culture and so it's christians who made these cards christians deeply 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 involved with the catholic church and so this is this is not death as in a reincarnate you know in in the, in the eastern sort of side of it where um you know you, incarnation is going to follow not that that's necessarily a, a great consolation in the eastern view i don't mean to imply that uh, nevertheless this is your one and only death this is it um the radical transience that is revealed in the wheel of life card this is what it all comes to um we already get a taste of that in the hanged man in in the complete humiliation of the self um, which we embrace in 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 terms of acknowledging our own um, unworthiness, our own lack of our own unworthiness. You know, we've we've got no gr no grounds to be proud um, in in view of our intrinsic um, uh, incapacity for for perfection. Only God could be perfect. There's no way that any, any creature could have perfect knowledge of the world, for example. Uh, because we're limited creatures. All creatures are limited. Only the unlimited w would, in principle, be capable of perfection. And we are not unlimited. We are limited. And therefore, our imperfection is intrinsic to our very nature. And that, that's why we should be willing to embrace the comportment of the hanged man and here we have to take it to its final conclusion which is that our entire self which we value above all else is going to come to an end our embodiment is going to come to an end and that's not to make us feel depressed this, this card is not intended to make us feel depressed it's intended to make us feel the futility of putting of investing our spirit
wholly and absolutely in our embodiment. It doesn't mean we shouldn't enjoy our embodiment. It doesn't mean we shouldn't em embrace our embodiment. That's the whole point of life, you know. That, that's the whole point of being a parent, is to encourage our children to feel welcome in the world, welcome in their own bodies. We welcome our child's acceptance of its own body and its own embodiment. That, that's the job of a parent. And it's a wonderful job. It's wonderful to make your children feel glad to be in the world. It's wonderful. But we have to be there for them at every stage of their development. We have to be there for ourselves at every stage of our development. And we have to teach them that ultimately they have to be able to see beyond their embodiment. That's what the whole Buddhist path is about, is going beyond. And that's what this card is all about. It's, it's impressing upon us the need to go beyond our embodiment. Love it? Yes. Absolutely. Embrace it? Yes. In Christianity, God comes to us in the form of a person. Jesus of Nazareth. We believe this because Jesus of Nazareth is perfect as a human being. And in his perfection, he reveals to us that he is in a state of communion with his Father in heaven. And he's basically saying to us that if we follow him and become perfect, we too will be in communion with our Father in heaven. And so the Lord's Prayer is, Our Father, who art in heaven, thy kingdom done, thy will be done. That is the quintessential going beyond. When Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane, and he knows what's coming next, his crucifixion, he is so human that his anxiety it makes him sweat blood. That's how much he wants to be human, just like the rest of us. But he then says, he, in, in his agony, he says, Father, spare me this cup. Meaning, for God's sake, you know, get me out of this. I don't want to be crucified. Spare me this cup. He means the cup that, that, that God has given him to drink. That means the burden of being crucified. Actually crucified as a human being nailed to a cross where he will expire in total agony. after becoming exhausted and in, in, in extreme pain. Like any human being, he does not want that. But then he says, but your will, not mine. And so in that sense, at that moment, he becomes the true Muslim. He completely surrenders. Islam means to surrender to God. At that moment, Jesus surrenders to God and reveals his true Islamic nature. Islam, the word Islam means something. For those people who um, are afraid of Islam as a, as a world religion, um, well, in my opinion, you've got every right to be, but I'm not talking about the world religion. I'm talking about the meaning of the word Islam. The, the, the Jewish word shalom, which is essentially the same word, shalom, means peace. But it doesn't mean peace like as in peace and quiet. It means the peace that comes from conforming to the will of the Creator, the will 
of this world's creator. When you conform yourself to your own nature and to the nature of this world, you are conforming to the will of the one who created it. And when you do that, you are in a state of peace. Even if you are a soldier slicing people's heads off, that's that's the, that's the that's the that's the samurai model in the east the the samurai who is enlightened enough to conform himself to the nature of nature knows that you do not fight wars out of hatred you only fight wars out of necessity. You only kill people. You only cut people down out of necessity. Necessity requires it, and so you do it. There is no hatred involved in it at all. And that is the spirit of the Christian soldier as well. Christianity had to come to terms with mortal combat. It had to come to terms with it. It had to come to terms with martial culture when it converted the Roman Empire. When the emperor himself became a Christian, Christianity had to come to terms with the Old Testament, where in the Old Testament the Jewish people are a militant people who are empowered and allowed to acquire territory by conquering it. When the Jews took the land of Canaan, they conquered the peoples there. Uh, they did so, feeling justified to do so on the basis of the moral abominability, you know, the moral abomin abominableness of the of the cultures which governed those territories the jews were taught by god in their in their own understanding in their own belief that their religious beliefs were morally superior vastly superior to the canaanite cultures the the canaanite cultures which which um allowed infant sacrifice and the worship of idols, these were considered to be moral abominations by the Jews. The Jews were repelled by them. They found them absolutely, utterly, morally repugnant. They were horrified by the religion of the Canaanites. And for that reason... It was understood that this world belongs to the Creator and no people whose religion is morally repugnant has any right whatsoever to have dominion over God's world. That was the justification for the Jews to conquer the land of Canaan. Catholics had to come to terms with the Old Testament when the Roman Emperor converted to Christianity because suddenly the Roman Empire became the responsibility of, of Christianity and that's when the theology had to be able to deal with it that meant that Christian soldiers had to kill people that pertains to this card they had to kill people In the time when these cards were actually produced, the Holy Roman Empire still existed. Christianity was still responsible for imperial, the imperial defense of Christendom. And just as in the East, it had to recognize that sometimes war became necessary. When Christian, you know, it wasn't a matter of applying the, oh, the turn the other cheek principle. Christianity had to learn that lesson and learn it very quickly indeed. Uh, because Christendom was attacked, it was assaulted 
over and over again. Um, it was assaulted by the Germanic tribes who themselves were being assaulted by the Huns. Later, Genghis Khan, you know, the Huns were from the east. Later, the east came all the way and attacked Christendom itself. Christendom had to either allow itself to be destroyed, completely annihilated, or fight back, defend itself. And so Christians had to make their mind up, and they did. The reason why we are as we are today in the West is because the Catholic Church came to terms with the need to take responsibility for imperial, the imperial defence of Christendom, which already was an empire before Christianity even converted it. And so they had to come to terms with not just death as a fact, but in, ter in terms of killing enemies, which in many respects went against the grain for Christians who, who did believe generally in turning the other cheek. And so and so death re re really was um, an ever-present um, challenge to Christian belief itself. And that's why the church didn't declare things like the tarot cards and Neoplatonism and the whole entire Renaissance didn't just simply out and out declare it to be heretical, which it, it, it did in, cer in, in certain cases. It could have done virtually with the whole Renaissance, C could have virtually declared the whole thing heretical, but it didn't because it knew that it, the most classical... Um, and antiquity, the, you know, the principles of classical antiquity were dealing with realities that, that Christians were not spared from. Christians were not absolved from having to deal with exactly the same realities. And so Christianity was always a very, very open religion which, which wanted to, to acknowledge where God was at, was at work in the non-Christian world. And so Christianity was always open to foreign cultures. It just simply didn't accept them uncritically. And what's happening here is that uh, with these tarot cards is that Christianity is um, dealing with these principles of classical antiquity, is dealing with them critically and is assimilating them to its own culture. And this particular card, the death card, the, the need to understand that you're on a hiding to nothing um, if you uh, go through life um, perennially um, invested in something which is doomed to, to failure, um, at any moment in time, uh, clearly that, that just simply couldn't work. There had to be a way of accepting the inevitability of one's own death in one's psychological comportment. And that meant that one's comportment was more, was more important than death. How you comported yourself in the world clearly was more important than any kind of delusion um, that, that, that you weren't going to die, you know, that you somehow were going to live forever, or, or at any rate, live as if you were going to live forever. That made no sense, no sense whatsoever. Your comportment was more important than the certainty of death. And that's what this card is all about.